Life has a funny way of teaching us who we really are. Two years ago, if you'd told me I'd be where I am today, successful, independent, and completely estranged from my family, I would have laughed in disbelief. But here I am, and it's quite a story to tell. I'm Jillian Matthews, and back then, I was working as a manager at TradeSync Solutions, a mid-sized trading company. I was good at my job, but like many women in their late 20s, I was starting to feel that societal pressure to settle down. I had a decent career and a small circle of close friends. My family consisted of my parents, who I was close to at the time, and my older brother Marcus, who was two years my senior and had always been the golden child of the family. Marcus and I had grown up together in suburban Boston, sharing the typical sibling rivalry but maintaining what I thought was a solid relationship. He was always the more outgoing one, the life of the party, while I was more focused on my career and building a stable future. Our parents doted on him, and I had learned to accept that as just the way things were in our family. It was at Jenny's housewarming party, one of those gatherings where friends of friends mingle over cheap wine and supermarket cheese, where I met Tom. He was charming in that understated way that sneaks up on you, with dark brown hair that fell slightly over his eyes and a smile that made everyone feel like they were in on some private joke. We got talking about our shared love of true crime podcasts, and before I knew it, three hours had passed. We exchanged numbers that night, and within a week, we were texting daily. Our first date was at a small Italian restaurant downtown, where we talked until the waitstaff started giving us pointed looks about closing time. The second date turned into a third, then a fourth, and before I knew it, we were spending every weekend together. Tom was different from the other guys I dated. He seemed more mature, more focused on the future. Six months into our relationship, we started talking about moving in together. He had a decent job in software sales, and we shared similar values about saving money and building a stable future. On our one-year anniversary, Tom took me to the same Italian restaurant where we'd had our first date. He seemed nervous throughout dinner, fumbling with his water glass and checking his phone more often than usual. Just as our dessert arrived, he got down on one knee beside our table, pulling out a small velvet box. My heart was pounding so hard I could barely hear my own voice as I said yes. The ring was perfect, simple but elegant, just what I would have chosen for myself. As other diners applauded and congratulated us, I felt like I was floating on air. The weekend after our engagement, I brought Tom to meet my family. I was nervous, my parents could be pretty judgmental, and Marcus, well, Marcus had a way of either making people feel instantly welcome or completely uncomfortable. There was usually no in-between with him. Mom opened the door before we even reached the porch. There's my baby girl, she exclaimed, pulling me into a hug before turning to Tom. And you must be the man who's stolen our Jillian's heart. Dad and Marcus were in the living room watching a football game. Marcus jumped up immediately, extending his hand to Tom. So you're the guy my little sister won't shut up about, he grinned, giving Tom a firm handshake. And you must be the infamous Marcus, Tom replied smoothly. Gills told me quite a bit about you too. The afternoon went better than I could have hoped. Mom insisted on showing Tom all my embarrassing childhood photos, despite my protests, while Dad grilled him about his job and future plans. To my surprise, Tom and Marcus hit it off immediately, especially when they discovered they supported the same football team. Finally, Marcus exclaimed during dinner, throwing his arm around Tom's shoulders. I've been dreaming of having a brother forever, but all I got was this troublemaker. He pointed at me with his fork. I stuck my tongue out at him. Please, you wouldn't have survived without me covering for you all those times in high school. True that, sis, he laughed, and the whole table joined in. The next few months were a whirlwind of wedding preparations. Mom took charge of the flower arrangements, Dad handled the venue negotiations, and Marcus, well, Marcus appointed himself Tom's unofficial bachelor party planner and drinking buddy. They started meeting regularly for beers, and I was honestly thrilled to see my fiancé and my brother becoming such close friends. The wedding itself was simple, but perfect. We held it in my parents' backyard, with fairy lights strung through the trees and mason jars filled with wildflowers on the tables. 
Our closest friends and family were there, and when Tom kissed me after saying I do, I truly believed this was my happily ever after. We moved into Tom's rented apartment after the honeymoon, a cozy one-bedroom in a decent neighborhood. That's when we started our saving plan for our own place. We decided to make it into a friendly competition, each of us putting money into separate accounts to see who could save more for the down payment. At first, it was fun. We'd compare takeout menus to find the best deals, have movie nights at home instead of going out, and cook elaborate meals together to avoid expensive restaurants. But about three months in, Tom started getting restless. We're turning into an old married couple already, he complained one evening. We're too young to live like hermits. I tried to remind him of our goals, showing him how much we'd already saved. Think about it, in a few years, we could have our own place. Wouldn't that be worth it? He would nod and seem to understand, but then Marcus started inviting him out four guys nights on Fridays. At first, I was worried, but Marcus assured me he'd keep an eye on Tom. I believed him. After all, who better to trust with my husband than my own brother? And Tom would always come home in a better mood after these outings, more affectionate and understanding about our saving goals. So I learned to accept it, even look forward to having some quiet time to myself on Friday nights. A year into our marriage, I was feeling pretty good about our progress. My savings account was growing steadily, I had managed to put away just over $30,000. I had no idea how much Tom had saved, we'd kept that part of our competition private, but I hoped he was doing as well as I was. It was a Thursday evening when Tom dropped his fishing trip bombshell. Marcus and I are thinking of going fishing this weekend, he announced over dinner. His friend has a cabin up at Lake Webster. I looked up from my pasta, surprised. This weekend? I thought we could finally have some time together. You've been working late all week. Come on, Gil, he grinned, his eyes lighting up like a kid at Christmas. I haven't been fishing in ages. It'll be fun. Just us guys, some beers, maybe catch something worth bragging about. As if on cue, there was a knock at our door. Marcus burst in, he had a key for emergencies, though I was starting to question the wisdom of that decision. Little sister, he boomed, spreading his arms wide. Please, please, pretty please let your wonderful husband come fishing with me this weekend. He dropped to his knees, dramatically, in front of my chair. I promise I'll take good care of him. No wild parties, no crazy stunts, just two guys trying to outsmart some fish. I couldn't help but laugh. Get up, you idiot. You're forty, not four. Not until you say yes, he insisted, giving me his best puppy dog eyes, the same ones that had gotten him out of trouble countless times when we were kids. They left early Saturday morning, loading the car with fishing gear and a cooler full of supplies. I spent most of that morning cleaning the apartment, trying to keep busy, but by afternoon I was climbing the walls with boredom. That's when I had an idea. Marcus's girlfriend Sarah and I had become pretty good friends over the past year. She was smart, funny, and seemed to genuinely make my brother happy. Maybe she'd want to go shopping, I could justify a small splurge from my savings for some girl time. I pulled out my phone and dialed her number. She picked up on the third ring. Hey Sarah, it's Jillian. Listen, the boys are off fishing, so I was wondering if you'd like to go shopping? Maybe grab some lunch? There was a pause on the other end. Fishing? Marcus isn't fishing. He's here with me at my place. We're getting ready to drive to my parents' house for the weekend. He's actually in the next room right now. My blood ran cold. In the background, I could hear my brother's voice, Who's that, babe? Just my friend Lucy, Sarah replied, her voice slightly muffled. I sat there, phone pressed to my ear, as the implications of what I'd just learned began to sink in. My husband and my brother had lied to me. But why? Where was Tom really going? Sarah, I whispered, please don't tell Marcus about this call. I need to figure something out. Just, please? Of course, she promised. Are you okay? I don't know, I'll call you later, I hung up before my voice could break. 
For several minutes, I just sat there on our bed, my mind racing. Tom's laptop was on his desk, humming quietly in sleep mode. We had always been open with each other about passwords, or at least, I thought we had been. His was simple, his mother's birth date. I'd teased him about being too predictable, about needing better security. Now, that predictability was working in my favor. My hands trembled as I opened the laptop and typed in the password. His social media accounts were still logged in, he'd always been careless about that too. And then I saw her name, Rebecca. The message thread was extensive, going back months. With each scroll, each message I read, I felt my world crumbling around me. Can't wait to see you this weekend, baby, your wife really bought the fishing story? Yeah, my brother-in-law's got my back. He's a legend. Ha, huh, she's so clueless. Must be nice having such a trusting wife. They had been meeting almost every other weekend. Hotels, her apartment, even weekend trips disguised as work conferences or guys' outings. The level of detail, the casual cruelty of their jokes about me, the intimate photographs they shared, it made me physically sick. But worse was yet to come. There was a separate message thread with Marcus. My brother, protector, best friend since childhood. She totally bought it again, Tom had written just yesterday. Your sister's as gullible as ever. Ha, huh, Marcus replied. Gil's always been a bit slow. Remember when we were kids and I convinced her that ice cream grew on trees? She's never gotten any smarter. You're the best wingman ever, bro. Rebecca says hi, BTW. Says thanks for covering with Sarah too. Anytime, what are brothers for? Besides, this is way more fun than actually hanging out with my boring sister. Hit me up when you're back, those strip club girls from last month have been asking about us. The messages went on and on. Plans for their guys' nights, detailed accounts of their visits to strip clubs, discussions about various women they'd met. Not only had Marcus been covering for Tom's affair, but he'd been actively participating in a lifestyle that would destroy Sarah if she ever found out. I read about how they laughed at my careful saving plans, how they mocked my dreams of owning a home. They joked about how I'd probably end up paying for everything anyway, since I was such a sucker. My own brother had called me stupid, naive, boring. The same brother who used to chase away bullies when we were kids, who'd held my hand at dad's surgery two years ago, who'd cried at my wedding. The room was spinning. I ran to the bathroom and threw up, my whole body shaking. When I could finally stand again, I went back to the laptop. With methodical precision, I forwarded every damning message to my email account. Every cruel joke, every planned deception, every piece of evidence of their betrayal. I spent Saturday night in a strange, calm state of rage, methodically researching apartments and making calls. By Sunday morning, I had secured a furnished one-bedroom across town, paid the deposit from my savings, and signed the lease electronically. Tom came home around 3 in the afternoon, his face flushed and happy. He was carrying a convenience store bag with a few frozen fish inside, a pathetic attempt at maintaining his lie. Hey, babe, he called out cheerfully. You should have seen the ones that got away. I was sitting at the kitchen table, my laptop open in front of me. Without a word, I turned it toward him. On the screen was his conversation with Rebecca, including their plans for this weekend's rendezvous. You know what's funny? I said, my voice eerily calm. I actually expected you to at least try to apologize. He straightened up, his expression hardening. Why should I? You want to know the truth? You've become boring, Jillian. All you care about is saving money and planning for the future. Where's the fun? Where's the excitement? Even Marcus says. Even Marcus says what? I cut him off. That I'm stupid? Naive? That I'm such a sucker for believing my husband and brother would actually be honest with me? Look, he sighed, running his hand through his hair, maybe this is for the best. We're clearly wanting different things. You're right, I interrupted again, standing up. I wanted a marriage, you wanted a convenience. I grabbed my prepacked suitcase from behind the couch. 
I'm filing for divorce. Don't worry about your precious savings, you can keep them. Though I doubt there's much left after all those strip clubs and hotel rooms. I spent the afternoon moving my essential belongings to the new apartment. It was small but clean, with basic furniture and a view of a small park. My savings, the money I'd been setting aside for our future, would now be my fresh start fund. That evening, I drove to my parents' house for their regular Sunday dinner. I knew Marcus and Sarah would be there, they always were after their weekends with her parents. Mom was setting the table when I arrived. Dad was in his usual armchair, and Marcus and Sarah were on the couch, looking like the perfect couple. There's my girl, Mom smiled. We missed you at lunch yesterday. Yeah, about that. I looked directly at Marcus. How your weekend covering for Tom's affair was, Marcus? The room went dead silent. Marcus's face turned white. What are you talking about? Dad demanded. I pulled out my phone and started reading the messages aloud. The crude jokes. The strip club visits. The careful coordination of lies. With each word, Sarah's face grew more horrified. When I finished, she turned to Marcus, tears in her eyes. Is this true? He couldn't even look at her. Sarah, please. The sound of her palm connecting with his cheek echoed through the room. We're done, she choked out. Everything, we're done. She grabbed her purse and ran out, the front door slamming behind her. After Sarah left, I expected my parents to be shocked, angry, disappointed in Marcus. Instead, my mother burst into tears, not for me, but for him. Look what you've done, she cried, rushing to comfort Marcus, who sat with his head in his hands. Your brother's relationship is ruined. I stared at her in disbelief. Are you serious right now? Did you hear anything I just said? About how he helped Tom cheat on me? About the strip clubs? The lies? Oh, Jillian, Dad sighed, shaking his head. Boys will be boys. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. Tom was just blowing off some steam, and Marcus was being a good friend. A good friend? I felt like I'd stepped into some bizarre parallel universe. He helped my husband cheat on me. He lied to my face for months. And now you've destroyed his relationship with Sarah, Mom snapped. Was that really necessary? Couldn't you have handled this privately? Marcus lifted his head, his eyes red but dry. Yeah, sis, real classy move. You just had to drag everyone into this, didn't you? I looked between them, my mother stroking Marcus's hair like he was a wounded child, my father giving me that disappointed look he'd perfected over the years, and my brother, playing the victim as he had his entire life. In that moment, something inside me broke and reformed, harder and colder than before. You know what? You're right. I should have known better than to expect any of you to take my side. Marcus has always been the golden child, hasn't he? He can do no wrong. Well, congratulations, you can have each other. I walked out of my childhood home that night and didn't look back. The divorce proceedings were surprisingly quick. Tom tried to claim half of my savings, arguing they were marital assets. We agreed to save together, he said in mediation, trying to sound reasonable. It was our joint plan for our future. But even his parents, who'd stayed out of the whole mess, told him to drop it. Don't make yourself look worse than you already do, his mother had said sharply. He withdrew his claim the next day. From mutual friends, I heard that Marcus and Tom were still thick as thieves. Without Sarah to keep him in check, Marcus had fully embraced the single life again. They were regulars at every bar and club in town, living it up like college freshmen instead of grown men in their thirties. Their social media was full of party pictures, groups of girls, and drunken adventures, not that I looked often, but word got back to me. Funny how clarity comes when you strip everything away. Without the distractions of a failing marriage or family drama, I could finally focus on what I wanted. And what I wanted was to succeed. I volunteered for every challenging project that came through TradeSync Solutions. The ones other managers avoided because they were too complex, too risky, or too time-consuming, I took them all. 
I stayed late, came in early, and poured every ounce of my energy into making each project exceptional. My first major success came with the Anderson account, a client everyone had written off as impossible to please. I restructured their entire trading framework, created new reporting systems, and increased their profitability by 47% in the first quarter. The CEO himself called to praise my work. That success led to bigger projects. I developed a new risk assessment protocol that saved the company millions in potential losses. I streamlined our international trading processes, reducing transaction times by 60%. Each victory built upon the last, and people started to notice. Jillian, my boss called me in one day, how would you feel about joining the management team? We need someone with your vision. The promotion came with a corner office and a salary that made my eyes water. I celebrated by buying myself a sleek black Mercedes, not the most practical choice, perhaps, but I wanted something that would remind me every day of how far I'd come. Six months later, I closed on my dream apartment, a two-bedroom condo in the city's most desirable neighborhood. The mortgage payments were steep, but I could handle them. Every night, I would stand on my balcony overlooking the city lights, feeling proud of what I'd built on my own. I hadn't spoken to my family in all this time. No birthday calls, no holiday gatherings, no Sunday dinners. Sometimes I'd see their numbers on my phone, but I never answered. The wounds were still too raw, the betrayal too fresh. Then, on a random Tuesday evening, as I was reviewing quarterly projections in my new home office, my doorbell rang. I wasn't expecting anyone, and few people had my new address. Through the security camera, I saw my parents standing there, looking older and more tired than I remembered. For a moment, I considered not answering. But something in their posture, the way mom kept wringing her hands, how dad's shoulders slumped, made me buzz them up. Jillian, mom started as soon as I opened the door, you look wonderful. What do you want? My voice was cool, professional, the same tone I used in difficult client meetings. They exchanged glances before dad spoke. It's about Marcus. We, we were wrong about him. About everything. They told me how Marcus had spiraled after Sarah left him. How his friendship with Tom had turned toxic, endless partying, drinking, hooking up with random women. How he'd started showing up to work hungover, then drunk. Two formal warnings, one for being intoxicated at his desk, another for no showing an important client meeting. He's been fired, mom said, her voice breaking. His references are terrible. No one will hire him. He's, he's living in his old room now. He has no money, no prospects. What exactly do you expect me to do about this? I asked, leaning against my kitchen counter. The marble was cool against my palms, a small luxury I'd chosen for myself when renovating. Mom's eyes lit up with hope at my question. Well, sweetheart, we know you're in management now. At such a prestigious company. We were thinking, Dad continued, maybe you could find a position for him? Something, suitable. With a good salary. It doesn't have to be anything too demanding. A laugh escaped my lips, before I could stop it. Let me get this straight. You want me to risk my professional reputation, which I've built from scratch, to give a cushy job to the brother who betrayed me? The same brother who helped destroy my marriage? Jillian, that was two years ago, mom pleaded. People make mistakes. Mistakes? I straightened up, my voice deadly calm. A mistake is forgetting to buy milk. A mistake is being late for dinner. What Marcus did, that was a choice. Multiple choices, actually. He chose to cover for Tom's affairs. He chose to mock me behind my back. He chose his friendship with my cheating ex-husband over his own sister. He's family, dad argued, his face reddening. Family forgives. Really? Where was this family loyalty when I needed it? When I showed you proof of what they'd done to me. You sided with him then, remember? You're being unreasonable, mom snapped. If you don't help your brother, we'll, we'll disinherit you. Everything will go to Marcus. I looked around my apartment, at the art I'd chosen, the furniture I'd bought, 
the life I'd built without their help. Then I laughed again, genuinely this time. I don't need or want anything from you. I think it's time for you to leave. I walked to the door and held it open. I have an early meeting tomorrow. They tried to argue more, but I simply stood there, door open, waiting. Finally, they left, mom in tears, dad muttering about ungrateful daughters. As I closed the door behind them, I felt a weight lift from my shoulders. Through the window, I watched them get into their aging Volvo, the same car they'd had since I was in college. I thought about Marcus in his childhood bedroom, probably nursing another hangover, waiting for someone else to solve his problems, like they always had. Last I heard, he was doing odd jobs around the neighborhood, mowing lawns, painting fences, anything to scrape together drinking money. Tom had eventually grown tired of partying with a broke friend and moved on. Karma, as they say, is a patient visitor. I poured myself a glass of wine, an expensive Bordeaux I'd bought to celebrate my last successful project, and walked out onto my balcony. The city stretched out before me, lights twinkling like stars fallen to earth. Below, I could see my Mercedes in its reserved parking spot, a symbol of everything I'd achieved on my own. Some might call me cold for turning my back on family. But family isn't just about blood, it's about trust, respect, and loyalty. Those who truly love you don't betray you, mock you, or try to manipulate you. They stand by you, support you, and celebrate your successes.